good morning to you all and a, ha a, ha a happy new year. And if you've joined us online, a warm welcome to you and happy new year to you too. I don't know if you made any resolutions, New Year's resolutions, uh, but given the times we're in, probably not very easy. But there's one thing we know, that we serve a God who always goes ahead of us to make our path straight. And that is a comfort I take from serving God. That even if I don't make any resolutions, he's always ahead of me. He's gone way ahead of me to prepare the path for me. And so it is with you. When Andy, our senior pastor, asked me to share a few thoughts with us, um, he gave me a free text. He said, just talk to us about whatever God lays on your heart. So I went into prayer asking God, you know, what can I bring to us? And the more I prayed and asked God for guidance, I felt myself leaning towards talking about some of the challenges which we face as a people, particularly in this part of the world, the Western world. You know, we are struggling with, you know, definitions and meanings of things in our time today. Um, take family, for instance. We're struggling to just work out what it is. Take marriage. What is it? You know, years back, we could comfortably agree to disagree on issues. But not so today. Today, we are being forced to affirm things we don't even agree with. Take the issue of identity, which is a massive issue in our, in our time. I mean, a little over two weeks ago, I think the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom um, rejected a petition by a group of individuals who wanted the UK government to issue passports which allowed people to just be gender neutral. So in the passport, the gender section is either male or female. But these, these petitioners were trying to get the government to issue passports which will have X in the gender column. And the Supreme Court says, no, you can have that. There has to be a way of identifying people. Uh, you, would have, you would think that would be the end of it, but no, it isn't. The petitioners are saying they're going to the European Court of Justice to pursue what they want. So in a sense, you can see how confusion is creeping up on us. It seems to be a fog which is settling on us. We can't see our way clearly that well. So what I've, I've called my, my, the, 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 the talk today is navigating the fog. There is a fog that seems to be settling on us. And... I want to, as followers of Jesus, try to see how we can pick our way through this confusion, pick our way through this fog. And we are going to look at the example of three, uh, four Hebrew boys or men who had been taken captive from Judah into Babylon. No, don't worry, we're not going to be talking about Daniel's 70 weeks. We're not going to be studying any beast coming out of the Mediterranean, so it will be nice and easy. So just a background. Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon, had attacked Judah and taken them captive. And as per his way of operation, he never occupies his conquered states, the conquered territories. No. He comes in, he conquers you, he plunders you, takes whatever he can, including personnel. The young, the youthful, the bright, the excellent people he takes back to Babylon. And that was the case here. And one of the people he took, a few of the people he took as captives were these four Hebrew boys, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. These two, four Hebrew boys he took to Babylon. 
and got them trained in the ways of Babylon, the language, the Chaldean language, the literature. He even changed their names, completely purged them of anything which reminded them of their culture, of where they came from, as people from Judah. So that is the background to these boys who now find themselves in Babylon. And Babylon was a very advanced culture compared to Judah. Judah was primarily a farming, kind of shepherding culture. It's like coming from a, farm, a farmland into the dizzy lights of London. You know, you, know, you come from, well, I'm not going to mention any names, but you come to London and it's all just so wonderful. And sometimes I ask myself, when you see heathen nations like Babylon so advanced, and I don't know if that rocks your faith a bit, that gets you to question, God, what's going on? I'm serving you. And, but then we get the answer in 1 Corinthians where Paul makes a statement that God chooses to use the simple things of our world to confound the mighty, to, to confound the wise and all, to bring glory to himself. So, how do we navigate our way through this fall? we will look at the examples of these four Hebrew boys and how they picked their way living in this heathen nation called Babylon at the time. Not long into their captivity, the first challenge arises. King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream and he is troubled. So he calls his magicians, the wise men, the diviners, the sorcerers, and he says to them, I've had a dream. I'm not going to tell you what the dream is. You tell me what the dream is and give an interpretation of the dream. They couldn't do it, so he ordered them to be slaughtered, to be killed, including the four Hebrew boys. Daniel hears about it, And that's where we pick up our story. So in Daniel chapter 2, reading from verse 1 to 3, it goes like this. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I've had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. So Daniel hears about the order the king had given for these wise men and sorcerers and magicians to be killed. So he goes to the head, the chief official of Nebuchadnezzar, and says to him, not so fast. Give me some time to speak to my God. They allow that. The interesting thing, though, is you would have thought Daniel and his friends, after all that they had gone through, their names had been changed, literally purged, they've learned the Chaldean language, the literature. But the one thing they never accepted was the idolatrous interpretation of the world, the idolatrous interpretation that lay behind the way the Babylonians saw things. Their education, the literature, everything they did they ascribed to their gods or to the king himself. So what do I mean by idolatrous interpretation? When we take God's beauty, God's power, God's grace, all that he's done, and ascribe them to anything or anybody other than God himself, that is a form of idolatry. 
So with all that Nebuchadnezzar had done to these four Hebrew boys, the one thing they rejected was that. So he, they still held God very deep in their hearts. So he said to the chief official, let me speak to God. So what does he do? He goes back home. In Daniel chapter 2, 17 to 18. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. This is quite profound. You're probably asking the question, how does that relate to us living in England? Well, it's a valid question. We haven't been taken captive across the desert in chains to a foreign land. But we can see the culture changing around us where we are. I mean, like I said from the beginning, we, we are struggling with the meaning and the, 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 the definitions of things in our culture today. It may not be as extreme as what the four Hebrew boys experienced in Babylon, but the substance is the same. How do we pick ourselves through it? Daniel and his four, boy, four friends recognized God, the God of heaven, as a central point of reference for whatever they did. So when they are confronted with this threat, they decided, we need to go back to the God we know. They lived in Babylon, but they were never off. They were never aware of Babylon. Just like scripture says, we live in the world, but we should never be of it. So the names changed, but they still held God, the devotion to God, very deep in their hearts. So they prayed. And I'll come back to this verse again, because it has quite a number of things which reveals how these four Hebrew boys really conducted themselves. Daniel 2, 17, 18. So they prayed, and God in his grace revealed the dream and the interpretation to them. So Daniel 2, 20, 20, 20 to 21, they thank God by saying, praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his, He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. Affirming God's sovereign rule over his creation. God is center of everything they believed. And it has to be so for us. How do we pick our way through this confusion, this fall we find ourselves in today? Number one, God has to be central in everything we believe. Because there is a strong current of secularism that seems to be squeezing God out of the public place. Some of us struggle either through fear or shame to even profess what we believe. In the workplace, we can't even talk about Jesus. But that should be the basic thing we can do. That we let people know that we are Christians. So God reveals it to them. Thank God. And now Daniel goes to the chief official and says to him, 
I know the dream, I have the interpretation. Can you arrange an audience with the king? That was quickly done, and Daniel now stands before King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, you need to be able to kind of feel your way into this encounter. Here is Daniel standing before this high and mighty king, Nebuchadnezzar, who has all power. And Daniel stands before him. And this is what he says in the engagement with the king. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 27 to 28, Daniel said, No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you were lying in bed are these. I mean, feel Daniel's courage here. I don't know how old he is at this point, but when they were taken captives, they were teenagers. So he probably was a young man. There he is before the king. And I'm paraphrasing here. He says to the king, you know, your wise men, your enchanters, your diviners, your sorcerers, they're rubbish. They can't tell you what you're asking them to tell you. But there is a God in heaven. Here is a heathen king. And you're telling him, his gods, his people, everything, they mean nothing. But there is a God in heaven. Feel his courage. Now, we're not having to do that in our world today. But there are many Christians around, dot around certain parts of the world, who even if they said they were Christians, it is the end for them. Are we going to have that courage to at least tell people around us that we follow Jesus? He affirmed God's sovereignty. We cannot ascribe God's sovereignty to any other thing, any other person. Jesus said it. I am the, the, the first and the last. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Colossians tells us that for, for Jesus, the world was framed through him, for him, and by him. We have to have Daniel's courage to be able to testify of God to people. And you have to admire his, his, his courage. How do we pick our way through this fog? We must, number, number two, do life together. And I'll go back to the verse I referred to earlier, which is Daniel 2, 17 to 18. When Daniel heard about a threat to execute them, he goes home and he speaks to his friends. Daniel 2, 17. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be of the men in Babylon. So the first prayer meeting, if you like, was called by this group of Hebrew boys. And we say this here at Riverside quite often, that we need to try and do life together. Because the God who created man and said it is not good for man to be alone is the same God who has created the church and designed it as a family. We are a family. 
And the encouragement is for us to try and do life together with your family, our church, belonging, finding a, 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 a suitable home group, one that works for you and be a part of, a tri group. Find one or two people and do life together. We are a family. You can't do this by yourself. It is hard. So the encouragement from this example is for us to do life together. Because the truth is, together you can do a lot. One can taste a thousand to fly, scripture says. Two can taste ten thousand. You can do a lot more together than you can do individually, even if you aggregate them. So the encouragement from this is to do life together. How do we pick our way through this fog? God being the central person in our lives, doing life together. And number three, they prayed. These boys were a praying people. Like I said, when they heard the news that they were going to be killed, they called the first prayer meeting. They were a praying people. Now, I can stress this enough. We say this over and over and over again here at Riverside. And, and I'm just laying out certain basic truths, certain fundamentals to our Christian walk with Jesus. Prayer is so vitally important for us. And you'll be amazed what happens when you align yourself with what God says, which is primarily what prayer is. That when we speak back to God what things he has already spoken. So when we say, your kingdom come, God has already declared that. So we speak that back to him. We need to do life together and pray and pray. And finally, I want to talk about faith. These were a people of faith. Now, I know faith has been described and defined in various ways. But for me, one of the ways I look at faith is that it is a response. Faith never operates in a vacuum. Never. It is always a response. Someone has to speak first, and then you respond to it. You see it in the business world. iPhone 13 is just out. It's been sold. And Apple has been bombarding us with adverts. What it can, it can do, the new technology with it, I haven't got a clue. But we hear these things. And on the basis of what we hear Apple say to us, there are people who will decide, I like it, I believe it, I'll buy it. It's the same with God. God has to speak first. And on the basis of what he says, we hear it and we make a decision. Do we believe him? God has spoken through his word. So when I hear the Bible say that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, I'm like, that is so true. It doesn't come any other way. We want to grow in faith. We have to get to know this God. Someone once said this, and I'm inclined to believe that, that we are saved by who we know. We know Jesus, he saves us, it's all grace. But our relationship with Jesus is enhanced by what we know about him. 
And that comes by us getting to study and reading the Bible to know more about this God we serve. And the more of God you know, the more you get to trust Him. The more you get to believe in Him, the more you get to stand strong in what you believe your God can do. Because it's in the same book of Daniel where it says, and it's the second part of verse 32 of chapter 11, that those that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. They that know their God shall be strong. I mean, this is a verse which applies for, for a future time. But we can apply to our time today. Strong here is not talking about physical strength. It's about our unwavering confidence in God. And it only comes about by knowing who Jesus is through getting to read Scripture. Faith comes by hearing. And these four Hebrew boys were bold and brave and full of faith, trust in God. And I'll read the last passage and we'll have a time to pray. In chapter 3, 16 to 18, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, these are the Babylonian names which had been given to these people. Shadrach was a name given to Hananiah, Meshach was the name given to Mishael, and Abednego was the name given to Azariah. They replied to the king, because remember, Nebuchadnezzar had had a dream. Daniel had interpreted the dream, and it's got into his head. So he erects a statue of himself and commanded everyone to bow down to it. And the, four Hebrew, the, the Hebrew boy says, no. There is only one God we bow to, and it's Jehovah God, not your statue. They were threatened with death, and you would have excused them if they had bowed to this image just to save their skin, but they refused. And this is what they said. We do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, The God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we cannot, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. That is brave, and that is bold. We will not bow down to the image Our God is able to deliver us, and even if he doesn't, so be it. We still wouldn't bow. And this comes because of the faith they had in God. Shall we stand? It's not an easy time to to be living, especially if you're a Christian. Even in this part of the world. I mean, like I said, the strong currents of secularism is almost forcing us to privatize our devotion to God. Now, for some of us, the only time we, are, we feel free to tell people we are Christians is when we come within the four walls of this church. But we want to be free to be followers of Jesus. And these are some of the pointers I've just put out there to help us. How do we pick our way through the fog? Is by letting God be center of everything we do, that we are a people who pray, that we do life together, and have faith in God.